by way of introduction, I'm Tom Torlone. I lead the, uh, the UiPath automation consulting team. And it, it's a little bit of a unique group. We, we work with our customers on how to build their program, enable their adoption, make sure that they're considering the proper use of this technology in their environment, and all the associated operational things that have to go into this. Uh, one of the key advantages that we have is we, you know, we have a very strong team of very experienced consultants that have done this for years, but we also get to work with broadly in the market, companies that are beginning the journey, maturing in their journey, some that are highly experienced and moving to enterprise level. So we do, do get to see a lot of various activities and we try to create frameworks to help everyone adopt this. So one of the things I wanna talk about today is, um, you know, from a market perspective, you know, what, what do we see happening out there? Um, it's, it's an interesting dilemma because a lot of companies take a very different approach to this. Some, you know, look at a proof of concept. They want to test the capability in their environment. They want to see some, um, you know, some positive enthusiasm from their business users, uh, all well and good. Um, and they do that. They, they attack those problems. They build automations. They begin to see value. Um, as they start to think about expanding across the enterprise, this is where things can get very dicey if you don't build a proper foundation to do this. So I'm showing here, you know, four typical paths that we see, some that, you know, get some, you know, small automations in place, all well and good. They haven't built a foundation on how to deploy and manage and use the technology appropriately. In some cases, they stop and abandon, you know, this. In some cases, they continue to grow, but they continue to grow on a piecemeal fashion and essentially become stalled over a period of time. We see other companies that are doing this, you know, step by step in their journey. We're calling it the crawl phase. Um, and generally the limitations on the crawl phase, they're getting results. They're seeing some positive benefits. Um, things are just not moving in a, in a enterprise wide broad enough capability. So their impact is positive but not as large as it could be if they thought about this in a different way. And then we have the companies that are looking at this on a scaled basis and saying, you know, I, I see the demand, I have the need, I'm aligning to a business objective, and I've built the proper foundation to really accelerate and use this in a very efficient way. So those companies are having very dramatic access, you know, success in the market. Um, and that's really what we want to focus on. If we look at those companies that are doing this well, this automation operating model is kind of the key underlying foundational element. Um, we have a framework built for the automation operating model. It is meant, as Param you know, mentioned in his talk, about how does a company <clears throat> and, the, and the rigorous operational constraints that a company has, how do I address that while quickly deploying technology and realizing benefit? Um, this AOM framework, this model is the key to doing that. Think about an operating model as a set of processes and procedures that really address all the repeatable things that you've got to do every time you build an operation. How do I ensure you know, proper coding of a robot? How do I ensure my path to production, the things that I have to do um, to make sure that my production environment is safe and secure and reliable? It does exactly what it's designed to do. How do I go to the front end to my business users and look at the demand intake and start to look at this in a way that makes sense to my business objectives? So we tend to look at this and say, the AOM model that has the most success really does this balancing capability between building your foundational capability, establishing the program goals, defining these processes and procedures and the services, at the same time, you're nurturing demand. So um, one of the things that we talk about informally is to say this is not a, you know, if you build it, they will come model. It's a combination of both. And you do have to find that balance point of nurturing demand from the business, building a pipeline of automation that has impact. At the same time, you're ramping up your capability to serve that in a rapid and efficient manner. That's what the AOM is, is intended to do. So when you think about this and I, I've listed a few, you know, kind of overarching questions that we always get when we talk about the AOM. You can see these questions around the graphic here, but certainly one of the most important is, how do I tie my automation initiative 
to the business objectives. And those business objectives are generally um, you know, very specific. They know exactly what they, they're trying to do. Every company that I've ever talked to in the world has a clear set of objectives that they want to do. I think the challenge becomes, how do I take this technology as an enabler to advance the achievement of those business objectives? Getting those tightly tied together is kind of the key to unlocking your potential use um, of using this technology to generate huge benefits. At the same time, there's always the question of a proper governance model and governance guardrails, the controls in the environment. I can assure you, I mean, you know, Jim just talked about um, the possibilities of automation in finance. Every time you automate a process in finance that includes an embedded control point, your internal audit team is going to want to talk to you about what does that mean to the integrity of that audit data point. Those kinds of controls have to be built into the model so you can answer the questions, you can put the proper guardrails in place so the controls environment stays intact, but not slow down all the initiatives that the business wants to achieve. So creating that balancing act again is kind of key. Then you're going to want to engage the business. And I, I think, you know, from some of the lessons that we've seen, the minute you start to unlock the awareness of people of the use of this technology, they'll immediately come forward with, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of other places to use the technology. So your ability to build that pipeline of automations and properly describe this program to them so they can think about it in the proper way that you want to use it as well as creating a priority order for how you do this is kind of the key to making this efficient. And this operating model framework does this for many companies. I, I look at this and I, I, part of the reason I wanted to use this slide is to say, this is the general overview. The graphic that we have on here is kind of the general overview of what an operating model looks like. It is, it does have a steering committee. It does set a direction. There is a, you know, kind of a horizontal process between business to the automation COE, to the IT function. That's how work flows into the environment. But then you have these adjacency, you know, um, organizations within your company. There's always someone looking at process improvement. And certainly when you automate, you don't eliminate the need for process improvement. You actually enable it and make it faster. So you're gonna wanna embrace the process improvement team as you're looking at these automations. I mentioned the internal audit and the and the risk and compliance teams. Um, this is a key point, and building those processes to enable and keep um, the internal audit and any risk um, procedures that they have in place, preserving that integrity is a very key point. And then there's always the people aspect of this, the change in communications, and how do I think about upskilling, you know, redeploying using um, the capabilities to, what, as I create demand and how do I think about, you know, reusing those people in a higher value process is kind of key. So the operating model kind of encompasses all this. I've listed a set of bullets on the other side, um, but certainly, you know, we, we won't go through those, you know, because of time today, but as you look through this, think about these kinds of things and how do we make a very specific operational plan is kind of the key. I think the most important one on there is the fourth bullet down, the operating structure. You have a clear responsibility matrix. You've got defined roles. Everybody knows exactly what they have to do every time an automation gets ideated, gets built, gets tested, gets taken to production, and then manage and maintain. That is a clear set of responsibilities that the organization has to have. The more you lay that out, the more efficient this deployment becomes. So one of the key things that we see of you know, companies that are having struggles and scaling is, is really how do I establish the goal and how do I align those goals to the business objectives? I think I talked about this earlier, but I can't say it enough. This is where a lot of companies hit that stall or crawl phase. They don't know how to align the automation capability as an enabler to their business objective. So one of the things that we look at is to say, okay, let's parse this out in terms of the types of automation. There is certainly task automation, and that's, you know, how do I automate an individual's activities, help them gain more productivity, more leverage, the ability to do more, 
um, or redeploy themselves into higher value activity. But those are generally focused on either an individual or a smaller team of individuals that perform a certain task. If you move up that value chain and say, if I look at this typically on a departmental basis, this is where I begin to look at end-to-end -end processes and say, am I using the technology to really drive the heightened efficiency of an end-to-end -end process, not just from an individual or a group of user perspective? How do I think about this model across a departmental end-to-end -end process? This is also where you typically see the marriage between automation and process improvement. As you automate these things, you've got more time to think about redefining these. So in a lot of digital transformation efforts, the bulk of the work occurs at this layer. Then at the top layer, um, it's certainly no surprise as you think about this from a company-wide perspective that there are cross-department enterprise you know, automation objectives. How do I marry what's going on in finance with what's happening in supply chain? How do I, how do I get the CFO information so they can effectively close the books on a daily basis, on a near real-time basis. How do I enable all of that activity that has to occur to give them intelligent insight in a, in a, a time frame that really is actionable, something that I can do proactively, rather than just close the book and look backwards and say, what happened? I can do something now on a daily or weekly basis to provide that information so they can proactively take steps to more you know, manage the business and be a bit proactive about what they're doing. So we tend to look at it in that spectrum. The AOM and the framework that's built in the AOM really encompasses all these things that you see on the left. So when you think about these layers of automation and how companies are deploying this, um, you certainly wanna have, you know, a, an efficient funding model in place. You wanna define how am I gonna measure value in light of the business objective that I'm trying to do. Typically, when I align to a business objective, you almost hand in glove get this executive sponsorship. There's typically an executive or a group of executives that own parts of those business objectives. Having that executive sponsorship is a key point to growing this at scale. They've got to be able to make the very tight connection between this technology, the way you're deploying the technology, and how that impacts their business strategy, what they're trying to get done. So that is a key point. There are many ways, uh, Paran talked about the automated ways of process discovery. How do we look at processes? How do we see what's going on? But even with that information, you've got to put a rational sense behind it to say, if I have a set of business objectives, how do I tweak that intake strategy to align to the objective that I'm trying to drive in the business? So rather than take the very broad view, you tend to look at this and say, I'm gonna create a priority order and things that are important to me and my business and align those discovery tools and a way to look at my processes that, that feed that business objective. So creating that process intake strategy helps uh, democratize this across your company. And then you know, lastly, and not, not to be overlooked on this, is when you do look at the, at the bottom levels of this, we, we talk about this all the time, Part of the value of our platform is you can have you know, bots on an attended basis. Every user can have a bot that does a lot of meaningful things and creates a lot of time savings and value. If you look at the users that are using that automation, it, not every one of those users is necessarily working on managing or you know, adjacent to a process impact. So in many cases, they're knowledge workers that pull a lot of data from a lot of systems, that gather a lot of information you know, upstream of doing their knowledge work. Bots can be extremely valuable there, but if you're only looking at the world through a process lens, you're gonna miss all of that activity. So we always say you've gotta expand the lens, democratize the technology, and you're gonna capture some very significant value added activities here outside of the process automation goal. But the, again, AOM is built to encompass all of these. Um, I do you know, give a view of this. This is more of a part of the handout, but I didn't just want to touch on it to say, if we look at the elements of strategy in this, in this first column, um, and then we talk about those three levels of automation, task you know, automation, process automation, you know, the enterprise level automation. These are some of the things that come into play 
as you look across this increasing breadth and depth of how you have to think about this and build an approach to satisfy these. So if you are at an enterprise level, you know, this list of bulleted points are kind of key to that strategy across these strategy elements. So I, I give you that as a leave behind, but happy to dive into that at some later, later date and time. Um, now, why is this important? You know, we, we talk about this, you know, we spent a lot of time on the UI path side of building this model, deploying this model. We've actually deployed this in literally hundreds of companies today. So we've had a very good view on does it work? We've iterated its design to continue to refine it, and we'll continue to do that over the course of time. But it's very clear to us from the data points that we have that there are some very well-defined benefits of a well-designed AOM. You can see these on the left. It does give you the consistency, the standardization. It does manage all of the questions around your governance model. The people that have to implement and manage and maintain they all have clear roles and responsibilities. So there's nothing that falls through the cracks on this. Um, it is the most efficient way of deploying this at scale. And that's where we typically see the highest value coming. So it's a huge set of benefits. It is operationally rigorous, but it's also the foundational element that we talked about saying the companies that are doing this well, they do this, this is the benefit they get. You know, the, con the contrary point of view on the right side is, Typically, when we see companies that do not have this or do not have a well-functioning and mature AOM, they face these challenges. So if you, if you run into these kinds of challenges in your environment, I would say the, the quick way to connect the dots is to come back and say, let's look at this AOM. Let's look at how we operate and deploy this technology because there's probably something that's missing or has changed in your environment. It may have been effective at one point and something's changed. So I give you that as a bit of an overview. One of the things that Jim talked about, um, you know, he gave you the broad view of how do I create the financial justification? How do I look at this and decide? I mean, when, when you're thinking about this, particularly at the enterprise level, you want to be able to have what I call the pro forma P&L. You've got to be able to look at this and say, you know, I, I can envision the technology. I can see how it supports my business objective. I've got a well-functioning and efficient you know, operating model. Um, how do I look at and say, if I go automate these things in this area of my business, I want to know the cost for doing it, the approach for doing it, but I also want to have a predictive view of what's the value that I'm going to drive. So building this value scorecard embedded in the operating model, we find is a key enabler to that as well. You build that, that pro forma, you, you know, as your, your skills develop and your operating model matures, you'll be able to look at those and have very good, strong indicators of a prediction of value. You'll know what it costs, not just to deploy the technology, but to maintain and manage the technology over time. Um, you're gonna get a more realistic view of, uh, of an ROI. And that is the key part of this, because when you're aligning to the business objective, this value scorecard becomes a bit of the report card of saying, is it worth it, not worth it? You know, how do I manage all of the key performance indicators that go into this? And there are ways of capturing those benefits that you want to go back and have a closed loop feedback. How did that come back to my, my pro forma PL? Am I achieving the benefits I expected to achieve? If not, why not? Is there something that we're not doing correctly? So this becomes a bit of a gating factor, but a very important one as companies scale this. Um, we do talk about this. We do look at this on a very holistic basis. So when we talk about program value, as Jim talked about, we tend to look holistically. It's not always about cost. It's not always about um, improving you know, a performance of an asset. Sometimes it's employee satisfaction. Certainly customer satisfaction is becoming more and part of this. Uh, part of it is how do I manage and you know, get most value out of my working capital, OPEX and CAPEX optimization. More and more as companies spread out across the enterprise with this type of technology, they focus on these types of things. So I, I tell you this, that the best way we've found to manage this is you create this value scorecard. The scorecard has to be holistic and you've got to have different ways and different measurements 
for what you're trying to achieve aligned to the value driver for that activity. That is the whole point around this. But the successful companies that are doing this take this approach. The last thing I will say is um, when we look at this operating model, again, it's building your foundation, it's making you efficient. We talked about the three levels of automation. There are ways to approach this on a bottoms up basis, on a tops down basis. They both work well, they just address different questions, different problems. We talked about the value piece and how do I look at this on a predictive pro forma basis? How do, how do I look at you know, the operation that occurs in each of these functional areas? How do I find the target rich you know, things to go after that I wanna go after first? How do, I, how do I create a priority model of what things to attack in what order? Um, part of the, you know, the value that UiPath has is on the right, we show these versions of heat maps. So we have a number of heat maps by functional area and by vertical industry that really talks about the automation potential at a lower level of activity within those functional areas within an, a vertical industry. Where, where are the high impact areas? How do I start to begin to think about this as a starting point to say, I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna look at these areas, and I'm gonna build a priority roadmap of how I'm gonna automate and the way to do that. So that clear direction, that you know, rigor in, in how do I approach the problem, solve the problem, is what the successful companies are doing. And as I say, we've built these frameworks, uh, built on those knowledge, you know, that body of knowledge, providing it to the market in general. So I would tell you that. Um, I will finish with one quick case study of saying, you know, as I said, we've, we've built hundreds of these. Um, probably the most important thing that I can tell you is if you look at this particular client, you know, we did deploy, build the AOM. It was built, customized to their environment. Uh, they did have IT readiness. So we stood that up in a very rapid manner and the impact was phenomenal. They went from deploying about two processes per month of being able to find them, define them, build a, you know, a process diagram, build the automation, test it, take it to production. That, that value chain was taking them and limiting them to about two processes a month. Once this AOM was in place, they were doing more than 30 processes a month. So a dramatic increase and a much more efficient way of looking at this. So I know this is a lot of information. Um, it's certainly if you wanna have a you know, detailed follow-up, you know, reach out, follow up, we can spend you know, quite a bit of time talking you through this. But again, thank you for the time today. And